On the 1st of March, 1811, the Egyptian Viceroy Muhammad Ali threw a party in Cairo at the Citadel, the seat of power since the 10th century. The Citadel is an impressive site, with its high defensive walls and a commanding position atop a hill near the city centre. The guest of honour was ostensibly Muhammad Ali's favourite son, who'd just received a military command and was going off to fight a war in Arabia. Invitations had gone out to about 470 men from Cairo's ruling class, known as the Mamluks. And these, and these Mamluk notables paraded into the citadel in an expectant mood, escorted by Muhammad Ali's loyal guards. Six years earlier, Muhammad Ali was appointed to his post. Being viceroy made him the effective head of state. His own boss was the Ottoman Sultan, who, from faraway Constantinople, that is modern-day Istanbul, ruled a massive empire that encompassed parts of Europe, Africa, and Asia. Early on, Muhammad Ali had faced stiff opposition from many of these same Mamluks, whose forebears ruled the country before the Ottomans conquered them in the early 16th century. Recently, both sides made concessions and friendly overtures following years of armed clashes. So by the spring of 1811, it looked like a peace agreement between the Mamluks and Muhammad Ali might be possible. It was at this moment that Muhammad Ali invited the Mamluks to the citadel. And then, almost without warning, the great doors of the citadel slammed shut, and every last Mamluk present was murdered where he stood. In an instant, Muhammad Ali had eliminated all internal opposition and secured his rule. Now we are going to see how this event sits at the centre of an even bigger story. The slaughter of the Mamluks was a turning point in the history of Egypt and of the wider Middle East. Until now, the Ottomans had succeeded in maintaining their grip, albeit remotely, over this ancient and storied land on the Nile which was among the Sultan's most valuable pieces of real estate. After the slaughter, however, it became clear that Muhammad Ali's aims were much greater than ruling in the name of a distant emperor. Muhammad Ali wanted Egypt for himself. This is the story of how he achieved this aim and began the long process of modernizing this center of the Arab world. Let's begin by considering Egypt and the country's place within the Ottoman Empire just before Muhammad Ali ordered the slaughter of the Mamluks. The first thing to note is what a formidable force the Mamluks once were, and for how long. The Mamluks ruled the country for more than 250 years before the Ottoman Sultan, Selim the Grim, led the Turkish Empire's conquest of Egypt in 1517. The Mamluks were former slaves, whom the Abbasid caliphs of an earlier Islamic empire had captured and turned into Muslim warriors, and who, in turn, eventually seized the reins of power from their own masters. Having originated in such places as the Crimea, Georgia, Anatolia, and the Caucasus Mountains, the Mamluks were remarkable for a number of reasons, not least of which, in an age of inherited power, was for their non-dynastic, that is, meritocratic succession. By the time of the Ottoman invasion, they'd already lost much of their vigour. This included the ossification of the ruling class's outlook and the hardening of its political institutions. Where once the Mamluks' approach to ruling the state was quite revolutionary, now they lacked innovative ideas and flexibility of thought. In this way, when they found themselves challenged by external rising powers, they were unable to mount a swift enough or substantial enough response. Returning now to the Egypt of Muhammad Ali's time in the early 19th century, Cairo, 800 miles from Constantinople in a straight line, was never the easiest of territories for the Ottoman sultans to control. And Egypt was rich and powerful in its own right. This, coupled with the fact that communications were not especially swift, 
meant that the possibility of insurrection or breakaway by a rebel government in this fairly distant realm was an ever-present challenge for Constantinople. Ottoman sultans, on a regular basis, felt compelled to relieve their local rulers or viziers. In more than one instance, this handover of power was formalized at the expense of the previous incumbent, who was executed. Not unsurprisingly, such practices heightened the insecurity and nervousness among the sultan's viziers or advisors. This lack of strong central control, coupled with the Mamluk's innate martial skills and major land holdings, allowed them to remain a force in the country, albeit unofficially. For me, one of the most interesting things about Middle Eastern history is how often major decisions that impact the region and individual countries there are made or enforced by powers from outside the arena. For example, Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798, radically weakening the power of the Ottomans and the Mamluks alike. Three years later, the British defeated and expelled the French from Egypt. But when the British themselves withdrew in 1803, the power vacuum they left behind was almost more damaging than the original French invasion had been. In the midst of all this political turmoil, the Ottoman Sultan had to try and reassert his power over Egypt as one of his more important territories. It was among the very richest agriculturally and in terms of trading opportunities, but also among his most troublesome. Now that we've established Egypt's position in the Middle East at this time, let's consider the person of Muhammad Ali and his rise to power. The Ottomans, as a Turkic people, weren't Arabs, the most prominent and numerous of the region's ethnic groups. But nor was Muhammad Ali, or Mehmed Ali, as he was called in Ottoman, a Turk. Muhammad Ali wasn't an Egyptian either. It's possible he didn't even speak Arabic. Rather, as an ethnic Albanian, he hailed from yet another far-flung corner of the Ottoman Empire. And instead of Arabic, he relied, according to eyewitnesses, on his native Albanian language and, of course, Ottoman Turkish. If you're ever involved in a quiz and the question comes up, name three famous Albanians, don't despair. I've got the answer for you now. The first name to remember is the man at the center of our story, Muhammad Ali not to be confused with the great heavyweight boxer of the same name, though they were both, as we've seen, capable of delivering a beatdown. The second name is Mother Teresa, the Catholic nun who worked in the slums of Calcutta, India, devoting her life to caring for some of the least loved people on earth. And the third name in our series of famous Albanians is the gloriously named 20th century King Zog, which is also a useful word in Scrabble, worth 13 points if your family allows proper names. If you're confused by the details of an ethnic Albanian working for the Turkic Ottomans and trying to take power in the Arab nation of Egypt, just remember that the Middle East, far from being an isolated or remote region, even in ancient times, maintained trade and other ties with Europe and other parts of the world. The expanding tentacles of empires such as the Ottomans simply make such links more obvious. Once the French, and then the English, had been forced out of Egypt, the struggle to control the country became a three-way fight between the Ottoman Turks and a separate group of Albanian military units whom the Ottomans sent to Egypt, and of course, the former ruling power of the Mamluks. As we've said, the Mamluks, descendants of Eurasian stock, were after more than 500 years in Egypt, the closest we get to a native Egyptian interest in this civil war. It was actually as early as 1805 that the Ottomans recognized Muhammad Ali as the country's viceroy. But it took another six years for him to get a firm grip on power. And in the decade between 1801 and 1811, a bafflingly complex series of political and military moves had ensued before Muhammad Ali Pasha managed to come out on top. Among other things, 
he had to see off challenges from rival Ottoman generals and viziers, each coming with their own army. And he had had to deal with failed harvests and famines, which meant that the possibility of an uprising among the people was a very real and constant threat. Furthermore, even after the Sultan recognised Muhammad Ali as Egypt's Viceroy, it would be decades before he was able to win the right to rule Egypt as a hereditary Viceroy, thereby passing control of the country down through his family. He was able to secure this concession only after persuading the major European powers, that is, Britain, France and Russia, that dynastic succession in Egypt would not contribute to the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. That was something the Europeans wouldn't allow, at least not until after the First World War. Ultimately, Muhammad Ali's success came about because of two things. One, he was able to beat his political rivals through a combination of diplomacy and battlefield victories. And two, after years of skillful public diplomacy, he won over the Egyptian people. So now let's look a little closer at this man behind the Mamluks massacre. Born in 1769 in Kavala, Macedonia, now part of modern-day Greece, Muhammad Ali was the only one of his father's 17 sons, by several wives, to survive to adulthood. His father was a commander of an Ottoman infantry detachment, as well as a tobacco and shipping merchant, and the father died while the boy was still young. Muhammad Ali went to live with an uncle, a local Ottoman official, and as soon as he was old enough, his uncle employed him to collect taxes in their home district. Although his early life might not have been especially remarkable, I'd argue that Muhammad Ali's early exposure to both trade and bureaucracy would later prove not just useful, but absolutely central to his ability to rule Egypt. He was obviously numerate, that is, he had a good practical knowledge of arithmetic. Yet he would remain illiterate until the age of 47. Not that this appears to have had any detrimental effect on his progress. Also, once he did learn to read and write, inspired by the magic of literacy, he promoted education in Egypt with the zeal of a new convert. Another family connection first took him to Egypt, as a junior officer in his cousin's Albanian volunteer army unit. Effectively a mercenary force under the nominal control of the Ottoman Sultan, Muhammad Ali's unit was part of a much larger force that was sent in 1801 to restore order in the wake of the French withdrawal from Egypt. Over the next four years, Ali, then in his early 30s, played off different warring factions against one another, whilst working hard to win the support of the Egyptian people themselves and the elites. He was a natural-born politician, and it was these same notables who, in 1805, demanded that Muhammad Ali be made the wali, or viceroy, or governor of Egypt, to which demand the Sultan agreed. So, Muhammad Ali's rise from lowly Albanian officer to governor of Egypt is nothing short of remarkable. As for the events at the Citadel, well, perhaps massacres are by definition infamous. These were bloody times. But in breaking the almost sacred bond of hospitality and security that a host is supposed to offer his guests, Muhammad Ali crossed a line in a part of the world known for adhering to traditions. Muhammad Ali also now decided to pull away from his Ottoman masters. As he wrote in a letter, I am well aware that the empire is daily heading towards destruction. On its ruins, I will build a vast kingdom of my own, up to the Euphrates and the Tigris. Between 1811 and 1840, Muhammad Ali embarked on a series of military actions that we can divide into two types those undertaken at the behest of his boss, the Sultan, and those he carried out on his own initiative and for his own gain. The first of these 
was his campaign on behalf of the Sultan to restore order in Western and Central Arabia. A minor tribe there, emerging from a remote part of the desert and fighting under a banner of Islamic revival, had rebelled and enjoyed remarkable success against Ottoman allies in the region. It had managed to capture the cities of Mecca and Medina, central symbols of Islamic authority to the Ottoman Caliphate. It took two of Muhammad Ali's sons, leading two separate campaigns to eventually crush the troublesome rebellion in 1818. The native Arabian rebels would rise again, however. And while that's not a story I can tell here, I can reveal the name of the rebellious family. It was the Al Sauds, better known today by the name of their country, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Muhammad Ali installed one of his victorious sons as governor of the newly subdued Western Arabia, which is the history-laden territory otherwise known as the Hejaz. And then he turned his attention to conquering Sudan. He undertook this latter campaign without the Sultan's approval. He was in search of gold and slaves whom he could press into service in the Egyptian army. Soon, he had Sudan under Egyptian control, more than doubling the size of his de facto personal empire. The next major campaign Muhammad Ali undertook was to quell rebellions in Crete, Cyprus and mainland Greece between 1824 and 1828. These were carried out on the Sultan's orders. But let me offer two annotations. One, although the Sultan was still able to order Muhammad Ali into the fray, he was in a sense forced to, because Muhammad Ali had the strongest army in the empire, and the Sultan's own forces were simply not up to the job. This must have been worrying enough to Constantinople. The second point to note is that Muhammad Ali was able to dictate his terms. Before restoring order on Crete and Cyprus, Muhammad Ali first was able to get the Sultan to promise the governorship of Syria and the Levant in the Mediterranean as his reward. His personal empire looked set to grow even more powerful as a result. Once again, Muhammad Ali's army was successful. However, his continuing progress on Crete and Cyprus and the Greek mainland now won him the closer scrutiny of certain European powers. Even before he'd slaughtered the Mamluks in the citadel, Muhammad Ali had started to transform the Egyptian army, which he knew had to be his first order of business. Not only was his authority being challenged by the Mamluks at the time, but there was always the possibility of the Sultan sending another army to remove him from power. With this in mind, Muhammad Ali wanted to be sure that he could beat all comers. Napoleon's French invasion of Egypt had shown how easily a modern European army could defeat the Mamluks. Thus, it made sense that Muhammad Ali turned to the French for help in developing one for himself. What he did then was to transform his forces from disparate and ethnically distinct foreign units, loyal only to their own kind, and gradually replace them with an indigenous national army, whose soldiers were drawn from the peasant class, just as Napoleon had done in France. From ill-trained and ill-disciplined expatriate troops, Muhammad Ali thus developed a distinctly Egyptian professional army. An additional long-term consequence of this policy was that for the first time in the modern era, a spirit of Egyptianness and national pride was fostered in the nation state. Muhammad Ali was also industrializing Egypt, creating a military industrial complex that allowed for more domestic production of arms and therefore less dependence on foreign suppliers who might be your country's friend one day but your enemy the next. Many of Europe's more powerful nations were no allies of the Ottomans, nor of the Egyptians, and rather liked the status quo. As a result, the Europeans didn't like the looks of the ambitious Muhammad Ali. 
in October 1827 on the Bay of Navarino off the coast of Greece, an Anglo-Franco force destroyed absolutely the fleet that Muhammad Ali had spent years and a great deal of money building up. The Battle of Navarino is also notable because it was the last major naval battle involving sailing ships. There are numerous reasons why Muhammad Ali's fleet suffered so badly. One of the most important reasons was this. Muhammad Ali, having relied on French assistance to develop and operate his navy, found on the day of the battle that those French aide-de-camp still in his service all absented themselves from the fray so as not to have to fire on their fellow countrymen. The French position was further complicated by the Treaty of London, an agreement signed just weeks before the battle. Under the terms of this treaty, Britain, Russia and France were essentially committed to military intervention against the Ottomans, in spite of the sometime conflicting interests and sympathies of the signatories. Consequently, Muhammad Ali's navy was poorly led and outgunned. In spite of the disaster at Navarino, Muhammad Ali retained power in Egypt and extended his control. He went on to rule for another 20 years, until the year before his death in 1848. He was able to do so in large part because of the administrative reforms he introduced to Egypt, and which we're going to look at now. But first, let me ask the question of why Muhammad Ali put so much time and energy into acquiring the empire he did. Were his land grabs nothing more than the actions of a greedy, power-crazed megalomaniac and dictator? No. There were other, more important factors at work, namely economics. Whenever Muhammad Ali instituted reforms in the army, agriculture, industry and other areas, these reforms were always based on a vision of modernization. And this, in turn, was based on his understanding of popular economic theory of the day, which arose from his family background in trade. The foundation stone of mercantilist economics is the principle that a country had to export more than it imported. And Muhammad Ali was keen to see Egypt start producing materials for export whether cash crops or industrial manufacturers. But production is only one side of the equation. After establishing manufacturing and other industries, what would Egypt do with its goods? Well, I'll answer this question with another question. What better means of opening new export markets than through, than through conquests? Perhaps even more important and far-reaching was Muhammad Ali's decision to nationalize all land in Egypt. What did this mean in practice? Well, with land now being the property of the state, he could direct, that is to say, tell, the peasant farmers what to grow. And he did just that. Peasant farmers in Egypt before Muhammad Ali had strictly limited their production to the level of subsistence. It's reckoned that after Muhammad Ali, the people had more money, but less freedom and less choice. The switch from growing basic foodstuffs to producing food and cash crops didn't happen overnight, but it was a revolution to those who worked the land. Cotton was the new cash crop that had the biggest impact. Around this same time, cotton production in the United States was severely disrupted by the outbreak of the Civil War there. And so, Egyptian production had room to grow even more. There's a reason why Egyptian cotton is still famous to this day. While it earned part of its reputation because of its quality, it first became widely known because of its quantity. It was ubiquitous. Another area of enormous long-term importance in Egypt was the rise in education. As an unintended byproduct of Muhammad Ali's programs of military modernization and industrialization, young Egyptians were initially sent to Europe to study before Egypt developed its own native schools and universities. 
Young Egyptians also brought home, along with their newly acquired knowledge of engineering and new agricultural techniques, talk about political involvement and other potentially incendiary ideas. We've covered a great deal of ground in this lecture, which is a reflection of just how much change, for good and ill, Muhammad Ali brought to Egypt. These changes included, but were not limited to, the introduction of a modern army, more modern education, widespread growth of cash crops, industrial development, increased profitability, and concurrent economic vulnerability. Whatever his faults, Muhammad Ali didn't want for vitality. It's hard to imagine another time in Egyptian history when the country underwent so many radical changes in such a short period of time. And what makes this a truly important turning point is that where Egypt leads, others in the Middle East often follow. Sometimes, Egypt's neighbours also sought greater political freedom from Ottoman control. At other times, they pressed for more rapid industrialization and more powerful militaries. If, as some writers have stated, Muhammad Ali Egyptianized Egypt, he seems to have done so by accident more than design. But regardless of his intentions, it happened. If you speak to Egyptians today about Muhammad Ali, you are more likely to hear positive rather than negative opinions about the ethnic Albanian who broke the power of the Mamluks and empowered Egypt to become Egypt for the first time since the days of the pharaohs. One of Muhammad Ali's sons, Ibrahim, said he himself always felt like an Egyptian and worked against Ottoman interests almost every step of his life. When Muhammad Ali died, by then he had fallen senile and relinquished power to Ibrahim, he was buried in a mausoleum, in a mosque that bears his name. It is situated in the heart of Cairo Citadel, where our drama began. But the longest lasting legacy of Muhammad Ali's impressive 43-year reign was securing from the Ottoman Sultan the right of dynastic succession for his heirs. Although Ibrahim governed for less than a year and died before his father, Muhammad Ali's dynasty ruled in Egypt until 1952, when it was overthrown by its own army. This coup was led by a group that called themselves the Free Officers Movement, and whose number included three future presidents of Egypt, General Mohammed Naguib, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and Anwar Sadat. Once again, in a trend that one could argue began with Muhammad Ali's modernization and reforms, the army had a central role in Egyptian politics.